The purpose of this video is to introduce the conditions of static equilibrium. To begin with, let us consider a common enough problem in daily life. You want to climb something, so you put a ladder against a vertical surface and the ladders, one end of the ladder is on that vertical surface and the other end is on the horizontal surface, such as a ground or a floor. Now I want to consider two hypothetical experiments, one in which the vertical surface is very rough, think of it as an ivy covered wall, and the horizontal surface is really smooth, like ice for example. And the other scenario in which the vertical surface is really smooth, like ice, and the horizontal surface is really rough, like concrete. Which of these two ladders would you feel comfortable climbing or even being near? I think it's a safe bet that you'll pick this ladder because this one somehow seems unworthy of trust because of the friction being zero here. To understand why you might have that gut feeling, let's write all the forces involved here. There's going to be a normal force. I'll call this normal force N2 and this normal force N1. And I'll just keep the same notation for both scenarios. And the ladder's got a certain weight, which acts right through its middle, assuming the ladder is uniform in construction. And now we have to think about the friction. A ladder likes to spontaneously slide down to lower its gravitational potential energy. You never find ladders creeping up to a wall like that. So this wants to slide down, which means the force of friction wants to act up. And in this particular case, it's the same idea. This wants to go down like this, so the force of static friction will act in this direction. Okay, now let's call this the scenario one and this scenario two. Let's ask if scenario one is possible. Well, first of all, you notice that I could possibly balance forces in the vertical direction by having the normal force and the force of friction be equal to the force of gravity. So that's certainly possible. All the forces up equals the force that's acting down. But there is no force to the right to balance this force to the left. So we are left uh, hanging. This is going to not have any force to keep it from sliding. So it's going to slide. One is impossible. So we are left just with the scenario two. Let's try to solve scenario two now because we know that that's the scenario that we're going to use. So first of all, if you call this the x direction and the y direction, we can write the sum of all the forces in the x direction and y direction. Let's do the x direction first. The sum of all the forces in the x direction equals zero. Well, that tells me that Fn2 must equal FFS. So I get Fn2 equals FFS then I do the sum of all the forces in the y direction equals zero. You don't want the ladder to be accelerating either in the x direction or the y direction. That's what makes for a safe ladder. So I went. I want Fn1 equal to mg. And here's where you notice the problem. There are too many unknowns. You don't know Fn1, well you know it's equal to mg. So that's one equation and one unknown. But this is one equation for the two unknowns Fn2 and FFS. Well, you may think, can I use the law of friction? You cannot, because the law of static friction is the following. The force of static friction is less than or equal to mu statics times the normal force. And the normal force for the static friction, uh, we're looking at scenario two. So the normal force for static friction is Fn2, Fn1, excuse me. 
So unfortunately, that less than or equal to sign means that you cannot think of FFS as being determined by FN1. It's not. It's just an inequality. We need a third condition, and that condition is called the condition of rotational equilibrium. So these two conditions are called conditions of translational equilibrium. And this is the rotational equilibrium condition. This condition says that the sum of all the torques about any axis is equal to zero. Because a ladder should not be rotating regardless of which axis you choose to observe it from. Now, in practice, it's common to choose the axis to pass through the point with the greatest number of unknown forces. So if you look at this picture, that has one unknown force. Well, that has two unknown forces. So the proper point, or the desirable point, about which to find the torque is actually the point P. So here's a hint. Choose the point or choose the axis to pass through the point with the most number of unknown forces. So let us examine this, the torque, some of all the torques about the axis P. Now here's where we use a convention, which is common in physics. We'll take all counterclockwise torques to be positive and clockwise torques to be negative. And you notice the distances are strange and the angles may not be really right. So I'm going to teach you a nice way of finding out torques as a sidebar here. So let's try to look at torque in a slightly different way. We know the magnitude of the torque is Rf sine theta. Well, I can write this in two special ways. I can write this as R sine theta times F, or I can write this as R times F sine theta. You might be wondering what's going on here. I'm just moving around the terms, but these two interpretations of torque are distinctly different. So in this case, suppose I have the R vector pointing like that and the F vector pointing like this. And the angle between them, let's say, is theta. So when I say that I'm looking at R sine theta times F, that's R sine theta. And I'm going to call that R perpendicular. So the magnitude of the torque is equal to the perpendicular distance between the point of application of the torque and the force. The other way to look at this, and I'm not crazy about this interpretation of torque, and I tend not to use it, it's that it's R times F perpendicular. I know that some of you in high school may have used this convention. And the way that works is, I'll take the same picture here. I have R and I have F. put vector signs on everything. Uh, F perpendicular is this distance like that. Okay, so that's another interpretation. I'm going to almost exclusively use this interpretation. So let's use this way of looking at things. From the point P, I want to now find the torque due to all the forces. First of all, let's remind ourselves there is no torque due to the friction force because that friction force passes through P. The distance R is zero. There is no torque due to the normal force because that force also passes through point P. There's no torque. There is a torque due to Mg. Now let's call the length of the ladder L. So that's going to be the distance, the perpendicular distance R is going to be this much. So this entire distance is L cosine theta. So that's going to be L cosine theta divided by 2. And is this a clockwise or a counterclockwise torque? R cross F is into the page, so it's clockwise. So it'll have a negative sign. So that's negative mg times L cosine theta over 2. 
and the other torque is this one. Now the perpendicular distance between this and that, that's r perpendicular, is just L sine theta. So that's a positive quantity because r cross f in this case is out of the page. So that's L um, fn2 times L sine theta. And that should be equal to zero. There are no other contributions. So I immediately can solve for fn2. Observe the ladder's length does not matter. So I solve for fn2. It's going to be half mg. And then I'm going to get cosine over sine, which is cotangent theta. So that's a great expression because it independently gives you what fn2 is. As an application, let's try to find out the minimum static friction that you need for a given angle of propping the ladder, just to keep the ladder where it is. So that's going to be our aim in this problem. Find the minimum static friction for a given angle. So let's try that. You'll notice that I have Fn2 here. And so I can set that equal to FFS because FFS is the same as Fn2. So I'm going to look at this equation. Let me rewrite that equation. FFS is less than or equal to mu static times Fn1. For FFS, I'm going to substitute Fn2 courtesy of the first equation. So that gives me 1 half mg cot theta is less than or equal to mu static times Fn1, which is mg. You observe that m cancels out, so the ladder, all ladders are treated alike, assuming they're made of the same material, like aluminum. All aluminum ladders or all wood ladders are treated alike and all planets also because gravity cancels and I end up getting mu static is bigger than or equal to half cotangent theta. It's a really nice result. It tells you how safely you can prop the ladder up. Let's take an example. How about theta equals 75 degrees? Now, um, the tangent of 75, it's, uh, I think it's between 3 and 4, so I'll say it's about 4. So if I, the cotangent of 75 is going to be something like 1 over 4 or 0.3, and mu static has to be bigger than or equal to half of 0.3, and so it's going to be around 0.1. Now 0 0.1 is the coefficient of friction of ice. So this ladder is very safe. It can even be used at that angle on ice. But of course, that's just propping it. You're not talking about anyone climbing it yet. If you had a person climbing it, let me just at least draw the free body diagram to show you what happens in that case. What if you had someone climbing this ladder? Then you redraw this picture because you have to include that other force. So I'll put the various forces. That's going to be Fn2. We're still going to consider the smooth wall and the rough floor paradigm. The mass of the ladder is mg and let's say the mass of the person climbing it is capital M. So here's the person climbing it. Draw a stick figure there. And so that, that mass comes down as capital MG. Okay, I didn't draw it in the right place, but I just wanted some space between these two. The normal force Fn1 and the friction force F sub Fs. And we could go ahead and uh, do the equilibrium conditions. Let's do the sum of all the forces in the x direction first. It 
It's the same as before, fn2 equals f sub fs. In the y direction, you're going to have one additional term, and that is the weight of the man or the woman. So this is going to be fn1 equals m plus mg. So that's the only big difference. And the third thing that we'll have is sum of all the torques about this point P equals zero. Well, the two terms that we wrote before are going to be exactly the same, so I'm just going to copy it from what I had before. MGL cosine theta over 2 plus Fn2 times L sine theta. And now I have an additional term that depends on where the man is located. I'm just going to call the person a man because I am one. So well, that's again going to be just like gravity, a counterclockwise torque. So that's going to be negative capital MG times this perpendicular distance. Well, that's X cosine theta equals zero. And you can figure out, for example, things like what's the safest distance to which this person can climb for a given coefficient of friction and a given angle and so on. So that's the kind of problems you can do. So here's an example. Find the minimum mu s so the person can safely climb the entire ladder. Problems of this type can now be solved because all you've got to do is consider this equation in conjunction with the law of friction, which says that the force of static friction is less than or equal to mu static times the normal force, and then you just substitute everything in, and the inequality sign will now work with the x value.